This afternoon we have a special topic. I was thinking that it is the time of Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year. I don't know the exact date uh, this year. Next Sunday. Next Sunday. So that's pretty soon, in eight days. Mm-hmm. And um, it means a new beginning. And thinking about that, um, you see, we, the last time we had the topic of prayer in the book of Acts, and then I said I want to continue with prayer with the Apostle Paul, several prayers of the Apostle Paul. But I want to interrupt that and then take this topic today in connection with the new year. And that this um, teaches us something. God is the one who introduces new beginnings. Mm-hmm. Now, when you accepted Yeshua HaMashiach as your personal Savior, God started a new beginning in your life, didn't He? Mm-hmm. And God wants us always to go back to that new beginning. Every day is, in that sense, a new beginning. God wants to work out things in our lives on the basis of that new beginning. And so it is important to see in this genealogy that the Lord Jesus mentioned as the son of David, son of Abraham. What this genealogy shows us is how God made this new beginning. If you compare it with the genealogy in Luke's Gospel, in Luke 3, you'll see that the genealogy goes all the way back to Adam. And there you see that the Lord Jesus traced as the son of Adam. So a true human being, human soul, human spirit, human body but also the Son of God. So as a man, he is also the Son of God. And he is God blessed overall. He's God himself. I mean, this is a divine mystery. Who can fathom the mystery of piety, the mystery of godliness? 1 Timothy 3.16. That's a great mystery. And so here in the genealogy, God is, as it were, lifting the tip of that mystery. It, you have to go back all the way to Genesis 3.15 where God spoke about the seed of the woman. That was in a chapter of total failure. Eve failed, she listened to the serpent. Adam failed and he transgressed. Both failed. And so in that context of failure we see God has a solution. He speaks about the seed of the woman. It's amazing when you see that in Genesis 3.15. And the old rabbis already understood this is a reference to the Messiah. Now when you trace the Old Testament, you'll see that at one time it's clear that the Messiah also should be the son of Abram. God started a new page. I I talked about new beginnings. Mm -hmm. God is the maker of new beginnings all the time. He made a new beginning there where Adam and Eve had failed. He would say, it's all over. No. God says, wait a minute. The seed of the woman. And so, what did Eve say that meant she had a baby? You read it in Genesis 4 verse 1. How did she call him? Cain. And what did she say? I have acquired a man. Call him Jehovah, the Lord. She understood this is the God-man. There are many translations that say, with the Lord. Of course, she had received this son, and it is a mystery how God can do that. But really, literally she said, I have a man acquired, and then colon, Jehovah, the Lord. She understood this is the seed. I mean, that's what she thought. Mm -hmm. This is the promised seed. But she was mistaken. The seed of the woman is not the seed of Adam. It must be something else. So she was mistaken. And yet we see there this wonderful mystery that God is able to fulfill his promises but not at the time that Eve thought it was still future. Now when you go to Abram's story, in the meantime you have of course Noah and the whole story of the flood, but we cannot talk about that in detail now. 
when we think of Abram, God started a new beginning with Abram. Abram was an idol worshiper. He lived in the days of Babylon and all the nations that we see in Genesis 10 were scattered all over the earth. Genesis 10 gives a list of 70 different uh, people, groups, and God took one out of those groups and it is Abram. You can see that in Genesis 12. The God of glory appeared to our father Abram while he was in Mesopotamia, but in you read in Joshua 24 verse 1 and 2, Joshua shows that Abram was an idol worshiper. Even the God, the line of Shem. You remember Noah had three sons, Shem, Japheth, and uh, Ham. Ham. Now Ham is the father of the Canaanites and so on. But uh, Japheth, more of the uh, western nations, and even uh, India. But uh, Shem is the father of the Shemites. And from the Shem, and from Shem, you had also Abram and his family. And so, what Gen Matthew 1 says here, book of the generation of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abram, he goes all the way back to Abram. But with Abram, God had already made a new beginning. Abram would be the father of Israel. Mm -hmm. Abram is the father of, ultimately, the Messiah. So this new beginning that God made with Abram, uh, he took him away from idolatry, and Abram was now to be the worshipper of the true and living God. Abram understood that, to, up to a certain point. And so when Abram arrived in the promised land, he looked around. First of all, he built an altar mm. to praise God. He arrived there. But then he looked around and he got kind of discouraged and God appeared to him a second time. I can imagine in my mind what went on in Abram's thought. When he looked around, the Canaanites were even worse than the people that he left in Mesopotamia. Yes, they were idol worshippers, but the Canaanites were even worse than those people in Mesopotamia. So God must have shown something to Abram and Abram built a second altar and he worshipped God. Abram is a true worshipper. The third altar is in chapter 13, connection with the promised land, and the fourth altar he built was in connection with the gift of Isaac. Finally, when he got his promised son, after many years of waiting, he called him Isaac, means laughter, and God showed to Abram, yes, he was going to fulfill his promises. But why it is so important that the Messiah is the son of Abram? Because what Abram had to learn, he could not produce the offspring from whom the Messiah would come. I repeat that. Abram had to find out that in his own strength he could not produce that offspring. So one day, uh, Sarah, his wife, had always been barren. That uh, means that she could not conceive. They were married for many years. God had given a promise to Abram that uh, his son would inherit th this land, the promised land, and then Abram didn't get a son. So one day Sarah had a bright idea, she said, you know what, take this, the um, servant girl that we got from Egypt. You remember in Genesis 12 they went off to Egypt, that was a mistake. Mm -hmm. And Abram came back with Sarah, but then in the meantime they had gotten Hagar, servant girl. And so Sarah said, take Hagar as a concubine, and then her son will be my son. Well, from a human perspective, it may have been a brilliant idea, I don't know. They thought, this is it. <laughs> no, this could not fulfill God's plans. God had said that he would give offspring from Abram and Sarah. And so God had to reinforce that point. And God waited, you can see that in Genesis 16 and 17, he waited for 13 more years. And then God said, you know, Abram, I am God Almighty. Why did God say in Genesis 17 for the first time, I am God Almighty? Because Abram had to learn he could not produce that offspring. Sarah could not conceive. And if you read in Hebrews 11, you see that Sarah also had faith. 
Abram believed God already in Genesis 15. But then he also believed God when God said, Now Abram, Abram means exalted father, your name is going to be Abraham, means father of a multitude. Don't make me laugh. Abram might have said, Father of a multitude, I don't have even a son. Mm. And why do you want to change my name to Abraham, father of a multitude? Well, God explains it to him. A multitude would come from Abram and Sarah. That's amazing. That's what God can do. And so that is what I emphasize, a new beginning that only God could produce. Mm -hmm. And that's what Abram had to learn. He was circumcised in Genesis 17. That was an outward sign, a token that... God had set aside what is of the flesh, what the flesh can produce. Circumcision means the setting aside of the flesh. Abram had to count on God, but also Sarah had to count on God. Initially she laughed when God was talking about that in Genesis 18. But in Hebrews 11 we see that she also had faith to conceive. So Abram had faith that in his advanced age he would father a child, a son. Sarah had faith that she would conceive, she never was able to, and she had passed the age already on top of that. She had always been barren, and now she had passed that age that she could conceive. Mm. And now, look and behold, lo and behold, God gives them both offspring. Isaac means laughter. Mm. You can understand how this is laughter of faith, not of unbelief. Mm. And so this is what God produces, where the situation is impossible. And I want to make an application for us today. Often, believers are in situations, and we had many prayers uh, earlier, many topics of prayer earlier, in impossible situations. Only God can deal with these situations. But what we need to lear learn is to give it over into His hands. As long as we try on our own, means and ways and wisdom as Abram did initially it won't work we have to give up everything and give it into God's hands so let go let God that is the principle and that is why the genealogy of the Messiah goes back to Abram because there you see how God is the one who is faithful to his promises and he will accomplish his promises despite impossibility. Now when you go through the Bible, the Old Testament, you see that God also promised not only offspring of Abram, the Messiah would come through Judah. You can find that in Genesis 49. Judah, you are the one. And there you have already the name Shiloh, to whom it belongs. The Messiah would come through the house of Judah. Now, here in Gen Matthew 1 verse 1, we have read book of the generation of Jesus Christ, son of David. So there was another uh, indication that it had to be through David. So the house of David. But if you continue then in the scriptures, you find two more uh, indications. It should be the seed of the virgin, and we'll come back to that in a moment in connection with Mary, the virgin, not just a virgin, the virgin, and that goes back to the seed of the woman. There is a connection with the virgin. But even then, there is an other uh, limitation. If you see here the genealogy in Matthew, we did not read the whole genealogy, but there is um, a name mentioned in verse 12 after the carrying away of Babylon, Jeconias. Now Jeconias, he was carried away to Babylon and his mother, you can read it in the book of Jeremiah and also at the end of Kings and the end of Chronicles. Uh, but if you read in Jeremiah 22, you see that God cursed the the king Jeconiah. Jeconiah was the son of a very wicked king, Jehoiakim, and he died uh, during the siege, one of the sieges of Nebuchadnezzar. And then Nebuchadnezzar uh, came back, and then he took his son Jeconiah, 
and Jeconiah and his mother were carried to Babylon. And when Nebuchadnezzar's son Evil Merodach was king, then he uh, gave special honors to this king Jeconiah. You can read that also in Jeremiah and in, uh, in uh, I mean in um, Kings and Chronicles. But my point now, this king was cursed to the point that no offspring of him would sit on the throne of David. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 22, you can make a note and read it at home, you can see that very clearly. So what we find here, here in Matthew 1 you have a genealogy, goes back to David, goes back to Abram, but there's a problem, because through the line of Jeconiah, no offspring through Jeconiah, offspring of David, would sit on the throne of David. So how is God going to solve that problem? Mm. Now before we, do, we go there, just a few comments. Um, in Jewish writings, when they would write a genealogy, they would not include the names of women. That was just the habit. In those days they didn't do that. But when you read this genealogy, you find four women. Aside from Mary, the mother of Jesus, you find four women. Why are these women included in this genealogy? For several reasons. First of all, to show um, who the Jews came from and who also the Messiah ultimately came from. The first woman is mentioned, Tamar, verse 3. She was married to a son of Judah, and the son died, and then, according to the laws, uh, that then the brother should take the widow, so the second one, the second son of Judah, took the widow, but he also died. And then Judah said, I won't give my younger son, he had three sons at that point, I don't give my younger son to Tamar, but then, he had an incestuous relationship with her. He didn't know. She was a prostitute. She showed herself as a prostitute. But only for that occasion that Judah passed and Judah had relations with her and she conceived. And you can read it in Genesis 38. So here we see how God used the sin of Judah taking a prostitute or he thought he was, she was a prostitute, but was her, his daughter-in-law. And Tamar, her sin, God used that to ultimately produce a godly offspring. Now that is why I said earlier, God is in the business of things that are impossible. From a human perspective, you would say, we won't include this situation in the genealogy. But God included this, and it is to show a point. God is dealing with sinners. Even Judah, and Genesis 49 shows that you are the one Judah, even Judah was a sinner. And also this mother, ultimate mother of the Messiah, was a sinner. And her act to show herself as a prostitute caused this um, birth of the twin, Pharisee and uh, Zara to occur. Genesis 38. So that is a dark page. But yet through the dark page you see the grace of God that God would take people like that to be included in the genealogy of the Messiah. Application. That God would take people like you and me today to bring us to God to be saved and for the Jews this was very important to realize the Jews were very self-righteous they thought they were the right people they had gone through the Babylonian captivity but they had come back and so now everything was in order they had many laws added to the law of God and so they thought they were the people no, look at this even though you are the people remember where you come from and remember you are not better in yourself. That's the lesson that we need to learn from a chapter like this. May God help us that we'll never commit sins like that. But we have to realize that in ourselves we are not better than uh, Judah and Tamar. That brings us to the next woman, Rahab, in verse 5. 
she was a official prostitute, not just for one occasion, like Tamar did, but she was known to be a prostitute in Jericho, of all cities, a very wicked city. But you see, there's a work of God in Rahab. When Rahab saw the people of God that come over the Jordan River, when she looked at them, somehow she got attracted to that people. And she opened the door for those two spies. You can read it in Joshua chapter 2. And that is very amazing that a woman of this background, she was involved in terrible things. Like the Canaanites, I said earlier, the Canaanites were evil, were, uh, idol worshippers, more evil than the Mesopotamians. They had a practice of giving a child sacrifice to Moloch, to one of those gods that they served, or Baal, maybe it was not the call, uh, called Moloch at that time, but Baal. And when they had those celebrations, then the man would uh, even give the own son to go through the fire, and then if he would do that, he would get the best prostitute. And so here is Rahab in that context, serving Satan. And yet God is going to rescue her from that world. When the two spies in Joshua 2, when they came back to Joshua, they had been in the house of Rahab, not to have sex, but to be protected. Rahab uh, identified with the people of God. She was a traitor to her own people, actually, but she had love to the people of God, and she identified with those two spies, and so she was then ultimately rescued. You can read it in Joshua 2. It's a wonderful story of God's grace again, and that is what was needed. The Jews needed to realize that God is the God of all grace, and they also needed grace, just like Rahab needed grace. And she became the mother of Boaz. Boaz is the husband of Ruth, and that is the third woman. Boaz means in him is strength. It's a beautiful type of the Lord Jesus, in him is strength. And a wonderful love story in Ruth. There everything is proper. Everything is in order, but there was a problem. According to the law, a Jew could not uh, marry a descendant of Moab or Ammon, not until the tenth generation. But somehow this problem was overcome. We don't know exactly how this was, but you see, the laws were that the widow would marry the next of kin, who would be then the Goel, the Redeemer, who would take care of the family, would buy the land and so on. Many details, too much to summarize now in a few words. But Boaz was such a kinsman redeemer. But there was one closer to him. And you find in Ruth 4 that the one closer to him, he didn't want to qualify for that. He passed. And so it came to Boaz to be the kinsman redeemer that implied also that he would marry the widow. But the widow was too old. Naomi was too old. So it implied that he would marry then the next in line, and that was Ruth, who was still able to conceive. She was not too old like Naomi was. And so this is the grace of God in the book of Ruth. The grace of God who took care of this difficult situation, difficult in many different ways. So this is another woman in the genealogy, and that shows, again, how God is able to deal with difficult situations, another difficult situation. Nothing improper from a uh, physical as, uh, viewpoint, but everything was above board, but everything was solved according to God's thoughts. She was a virtuous woman, as you find in the book of Ruth. Mm -hmm. Boaz was a virtuous man. And he married a virtuous woman. It's a beautiful uh, illustration. And that brings us then to the fourth woman, and she is the one whom, who Solomon, Solomon had. David, verse 6. Jesse, so Jesse was the offspring of Boaz um, and Ruth, Obed, 
Obed was his son, so that's the grandson, and then the grandson begat David. So David, you find it at the end of the book of Ruth, the last word is David. It is important to see that this is his genealogy, where he came from, to be the uh, king as God had promised. And on, uh, only here it is mentioned, the king. This is a very special emphasis. But then when you go to verse 6 in the middle, David begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. So here is another problem. Here is a believer, David, who is even uh, promised earlier to be the forefather of the Messiah, and David sinned. See, his army had gone with Joab to fight against the, Mo the Ammonites. You can see that in Second Samuel 7. And for some reason or another, we don't know why, David stayed in Jerusalem. And one afternoon he was on the roof of his, of his house and he was walking there and then he saw a beautiful woman bathing herself. Now, you don't believe that she did not do that for a purpose. She knew that the king was there. And so she was a seductress. She was seducing the king. Her husband was away. He was on the battlefield. And she wanted to do something. And then when David saw her, he wanted to have something with her too. That was a great sin. God is not against sex, but outside of marriage is a no-no. And so both were adulteresses, adulteress and an adulterer. And that is a long story. Of course, she had just had her period, and so from a human perspective she would not conceive. They could easily have, nobody would know anything but God. You know, God knows everything. Mm -hmm. God knew all about this and He allowed her to become pregnant. That was against all the expectations. And that child ultimately died. But then David repented from his sin. He also caused the death of Uriah. Uriah is a wonderful man. He was a Hittite, he got saved, he became a Jew, or an Israelite. He was a faithful servant of uh, David, even one of his heroes. And David caused the death of this wonderful man. It is terrible when you think about that. And when you read then how David was restored from this terrible sin, this is an object lesson for us. That is why it is recorded in the genealogy. This whole matter shows you can be the best man, the king of Israel. You can be the most beautiful woman uh, in Israel, like Bathsheba, and yet you can do terrible things. And so, here is what we learn from this chapter, and that God in His grace allowed these people to be the ancestors of the Messiah. You, it's unbelievable! Mm -hmm. We would never have written a genealogy like that, even if we would know the facts, we would just skip them. So, what does God do? He is going to fulfill His promises through failing people. And then He's going to use people very obscure, Joseph and Mary, were descendants of David from different lines. I mentioned already earlier, um, Joseph came from this line of Jeconiah that had been cursed, but Mary, and you can see that in Luke 3, she came from another line from Nathan. So David had several sons, and from Nathan, Mary came. Now, in the days that Mary lived, there were probably many descendants that came from that line of Nathan. So how could you see that all those other descendants did not qualify to become the promised Messiah? It took God's intervention in two ways. First of all, that God led Joseph to adopt 
Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus was not the physical son of Joseph, but Joseph adopted him. He became his adopted father. And he, uh, we have read that uh, this afternoon how this came all about. I come, I come back to that in a few moments. But if you study Ma uh, Mary's genealogy, you will have a hard time to find that it is her genealogy, because genealogy, the genealogy goes from Joseph back to Adam. But then there is a key. In Luke 3, in the genealogy, you find the name. I'll just uh, look it up. It's very interesting. In Luke 3, Verse 23, Jesus himself about, began to be about 30 years of age, being, it was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Matthew, and so on, and so goes back to the son of Adam, the son of God. But there is one point, you cannot see in the English, but it is in the Greek text, there is one thing, and that is this, that in front of the name Joseph is not a definite article. Why? Because Joseph is not the real father of the Lord Jesus. So, what happened with the Leverate's marriage in Israel, when a man would take um, the widow, then you have a, a picture like this, and that is the picture you have here in Luke 3.23. Heli must have married someone of the line from Nathan and from this line was then Mary. That is what we can uh, grasp when we put everything together. Heli or Eli was the mother of Mary who was married to Joseph. But here is the, come the two lines together. It was supposed to be that. But Joseph was not the real father of the Lord Jesus. He was the adopted father. The real uh, physical line was through Mary, who was the daughter of Eli, who was the son of Matthew, and so on, and so on. So only when we read very carefully, uh, we can see how Luke took great care to follow Jewish procedures. Jewish procedures were you would not include a woman's name in the line of genealogy. But this way is the only way we can see that there was something special that in front of the name Joseph there is not the definite article as in all the other names that goes in that goes through this genealogy. That is the only indication we have here for the, um, the relationship between Joseph and Mary. Now, when we go back to Matthew 1, we see one thing that I want to mention. We didn't read it in verse 16, but it says in verse 16 that Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus. Now, whom is in the Greek feminine. You cannot see it in the English, but it is of whom means a feminine person. Of whom Mary, whom is referring to Mary, not Joseph of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ, or Messiah. So here you have the two names. You saw in verse 1, book of generation, of the generation of Jesus Christ. Jesus, the Messiah. And that is the point here in verse 16. He is Mary's son, but Joseph's adopted son. He was born of Mary, and now he's called Christ, the Messiah, anointed one. He is God's anointed one. If you read in the Gospels, you find several occasions that the Lord Jesus was declared to be the Messiah, the anointed one. It is at uh, the baptism of John the Baptist for the first time. That the heavens were opened, the Holy Spirit came and rested on the head of the Messiah, and then the, the heavens were opened and God's voice was heard this is my beloved son in whom I found my delight he is the anointed one from Acts 10 we know that this is 
the anointing God anointed the Lord Jesus that day and that is why he's called the Christ the anointed one but he's also the son of David the anointed one comes from the line of David and goes back all the way to Abram the father of the Jews so he is a true Jew through the line of Abram he's in the royal line son of David not through Jeconiah and Joseph but through Mary and Nathan he's also the son of Adam true man in in, uh, Luke 3 and he's the son of God and he is God Mm. amazing how great he is that is the person we are talking about that is the Lord Jesus the Messiah Yeshua HaMashiach now Yeshua means uh, Jehovah or Yahweh is Savior that is in verse 21 his name Jesus so that means that Yahweh Jehovah some are reluctant to pronounce the name but it is truly the case he is salvation that is what Yeshua means Jehovah God is Savior and so God is the Savior but here the Lord Jesus is also the Savior he is the Savior God himself and so make the connection with the the verses that go before just very briefly verse 16 we have seen that he was born of Mary and he is Jesus and I said already what it means who is called Christ and that is legitimate he is the anointed one as king he was anointed see in Matthew he is to show who is the king according to God's thoughts Matthew shows that the Lord Jesus is the king according to God's thoughts he qualifies he is the true servant in Mark he is the true man and also humanly speaking from a human perspective the, the priest morally but not literally and he is the son of God in John's gospel but here in Matthew it is to show that he really qualifies he is the Messiah he qualifies from what the Bible explains here there's no question about it now why are all these generations summed up in verse 17 3 times 14 you know David the numerical value of the name David is 14 so in the Hebrew the letters of David we put them together uh, comes to the value of 14 and here we have 3 times 14 the generation from Abram to David and then from David to the Babylonian captivity and from the the Babylonian Babylonian captivity unto the Messiah 14 generations 3 times 14 sometimes Matthew skips a few generations again that's another thing that uh, was not allowed by the Jews but here God's in control God dropped four generations because of the connection with the wicked King Ahab and Jezebel and for another reason so he (coughs) skips some generations but here he sums them up three times fourteen fourteen as I say is the numerical value of David and three times fourteen is forty two six times seven there is perfection there but six is the number of man the Lord Jesus would be a true man six but in perfection seven and there's another wonderful thing connected with the name Jesus and that is that the numerical value in the Greek of Jesus is 888 888 that is really it stands for a new beginning I said earlier God is doing a new beginning the number eight and it is emphasized 888 emphasizes this and it is the same idea have here in verse 17 with the repetition of three times 14 the same concept it is to re-emphasize a point and then verse 18 now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows and so now he describes what happened uh, his mother okay I just hold it here just to finish another thought I mentioned earlier Matthew shows in his writings that the king really qualifies and he shows this is the anointed king and so this is very important that Matthew shows in every aspect this is the 
one who qualifies to be the true king according to God's thoughts. And yet he was rejected. That is what you find later on in the book. And that is why this genealogy is so important. Although he was rejected by his own people, God is still able to deal with that. He was able to deal with the sins of Abram and Sarah, with um, Judah and Tamar, with, uh, uh, with Rahab, and so on, God and, and David and, uh, and Bathsheba. So God is able to deal with sins and to restore people, to save people, but also to restore them. And that is an important lesson also for the Jewish people. Yes, they have failed. They rejected their own Messiah. But God is still able to heal them, to bring them back. And so that is the message even to Jewish people for today that comes from this chapter and from this whole gospel. Yes, you have failed. You have rejected your own Messiah. But it's still the day of grace. You still can come. You still can be saved. That is wonderful. That is the background message, if I may say it in this way. And so it would also be important for Jewish people to understand that this is really the Messiah. He really came. God fulfilled His promises. There is no question about that. And everything is in order. Um, we see that with Joseph, how he was careful, he was betrothed, she was a virgin, and from Isaiah 7 we know she's the virgin, some translations have a virgin, but it says the virgin, and in the Hebrew the word Alma there is young woman, and some say, well, that just means young woman, but in the Greek translation of that verse in Isaiah 7, the Greek translation, also made by Jewish people by the way, they took the Greek word patinos, which means really virgin. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, she was a virgin, and what we find here is very clear. She, they were betrothed, they were engaged, but they had waited, they had no relations. They waited till the day, uh, one year later, of their marriage would take place. But in the meantime, she got pregnant. <gasps> Joseph, what? We can imagine how, how terrible it was for him. They were, Joseph was a just man, and he knew that Mary was reliable, and yet, how is that possible that she got pregnant? And so, that is the secret that explained in Luke 1. Uh, Angel Gabriel explained it to her. The Holy Spirit would uh, overshadow her, and she would conceive this divine offspring through the Holy Spirit. It's a great mystery how that is possible and here the tip of the veil is lifted a little bit by the angel saying to uh, Joseph um, son of David fear not to take to thee Mary thy wife thy wife they were not married yet but they had signed a married contract so in that sense she was his wife but they had no relations yet and he says, the angel says, for that which is begotten in her is of Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, she conceived of the Holy Spirit. And that is explained in more detail in Luke 1. And that this is the divine offspring that would come this way through Mary. And verse 21, she shall bring forth a son. So she would be the mother of a son, and the son would be called Ye Jesus, Jesus. It would be, it's a long way to explain that, but it is really Yeshua. For he shall save his people from their sins. Here's the explanation of the name Jesus. Why is the name Jesus so important? For Yeshua shall save his people from their sins. So again, this is the message, especially for the Jewish people. His people refers to the Jewish people here. But they needed to be saved from their sins. As I said earlier, in the genealogy you see a few examples of that. And so the people in Jesus' day, and even up today, they need to be saved from their sins. And He is the one who is going to take care of that, because He would be the divine sacrifice, as you find later in this book in Matthew. So this is all connected with a new beginning, as I said, Rosh Hashanah, a new beginning, it starts all here with this divine intervention and it says in verse 22 all this came to pass that might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord 
through the prophet saying behold the virgin in verse 23 it's very important to underline it it's not just a virgin the virgin goes back to Isaiah 7 it goes back to the seed of the woman in Genesis 3.15 shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel that's the second name he would have two names in fact the Lord has many different names here are only two names that are mentioned Emmanuel means literally with us God see they could never produce this offspring we saw with Abram, he could not produce this offspring. No one could produce this offspring that took a divine intervention. And that's what we have here. Emmanuel, this is God. That is why this could come all about. And so, this name is very important. And I want to come back one more time of this, to this secret, and then we conclude with Matthew 1. This new beginning is so important, if you see that the nation rejected their own Messiah in Matthew 23 the Lord says in uh, Matthew 23 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem the city that kills the prophets and stones those that are sent into her, how often would I have gathered thy children as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings and ye would not, so many times the Messiah had reached out to them so that they would uh, accept the message of salvation only a few accepted his message but the majority rejected him and so he weeps over Jerusalem as you find in uh, Luke's gospel and here he says something very important verse 38 and verse 39 behold your house your house means the temple your Jerusalem your house is left unto you desolate that is going to happen because they rejected the Messiah that God gave the temple would be destroyed the city would be destroyed your house will be left unto you desolate was already predicted in Daniel 9 and that, is, that happened in the year 70 AD when the temple was destroyed Jerusalem was destroyed this was fulfilled because they rejected the Messiah but it's not the end of it verse 39 I say to you, ye shall in no wise see me henceforth until ye say, Blessed be he that comes in the name of the Lord. There is hope. Yes, they rejected the Messiah. Yes, the temple was destroyed. Yes, the city was destroyed. And even the second time in the year 135. Terrible situation even when the temple will be rebuilt in the near future, we don't know when the temple will be used by the Antichrist there will be terrible idol worship going on in that temple and God will send judgment over that temple it will be destroyed a second time uh, another time the third time actually why does God allow that? because in their hardening they have rejected the true Messiah and only when they cry out to God, when they confess their sins, as you have in Isaiah 53, then the Messiah will come. As he says here, you will see in no wise me again until you say, Blessed be he that comes in the name of the Lord. So there will be a turning point that they will turn to the Messiah. And actually, just a few, very quickly, after the rapture of the church that may take place today, we don't know all the believers from Jews and Gentiles belong to one worldwide church, the church of God of the living God, will be raptured that can happen today or tomorrow we don't know when that is the blessed hope we have in the New Testament the Lord will come himself to take us away from this scene but then there will be a Jewish remnant who will prepare the nation to accept the Messiah in a future day. That remnant will preach the gospel of the kingdom worldwide, but also to Israel, and they will continue their ministry, and then at the end of the tribulation period, when everything seems to be over, when they, as a nation, then turn to the Messiah and cry out to Him, then He will come. Not before that. 
When they will call him to come, he will come. Blessed be he that comes in the name of the Lord. He is going to come. The promise is there. And so that is the new beginning that I mentioned. God is able to produce a new beginning in impossible context, impossible situations. And here we have such an impossible situation. That is one of the many impossible situations. And that is how God glorifies himself. That he works in situations that it is absolutely impossible that these promises could be fulfilled. And yet they will be fulfilled. Now that's the God who is dealing in your and my life today. He is the God of the impossible. Mm -hmm. And he is a faithful God. Now he wants us to be faithful and serve him as we wait for his son to come soon. There were Jewish believers in Thessalonica and Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 1 that he had turned together with others, with non-Jewish believers who turned from the idols, they had turned to the living and true God to serve him and to expect to await his son to come from heaven. So that is our setting. We have accepted the Messiah. We serve Him as we wait for His soon coming. So praise the Lord. God is the God of new beginnings. And Rosh Hashanah is just an example of that. How God is faithful. He will work a new beginning. Not necessarily because they produce 400 new shofars. No. God is working in sovereign grace in a mysterious way. But somehow the line of what God does in a mysterious way comes together with failing man. And that's what we find in the genealogy. What God does with failing people and what God only can do, like with the virgin, the two come together. And that is how there can be a new beginning. That this sovereign God, the God of the new beginnings, is using failing people and somehow he works things out that's a mystery in itself but that's how God works and today he wants to use you and me to be available to him so that he can produce something also in our lives which is for his honor and glory that is a divine mystery and I want you to meditate on that how God can use failing people and we are responsible and yet God can use us and work something in his greatness. And that is the secret here of the genealogy. That God is using failing, failing people and yet he will fulfill his promises. How great he is. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen.